and Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering from Syracuse University and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Texas. During the past six and a half years uh, of biometry theory professional uh, tenure at uh, Hudson Products, uh, Baumic has focused on R&D and thereby helped bring new and improved industrial axial fan products to market. Uh, he has also provided support to design, optimize fans, and troubleshoot performance and vibration issues for ACC uh, cooling tower and heat exchangers. So, uh, uh, Baumic, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Riyadh, for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, as Riyadh Mans mentioned, I've been doing some R and D uh, and and trying to design efficient and lower noise axial fans for the past six and a half, seven years now for Hudson Products, which is now a part of Chart Industries. Um, and, and as a result of that, uh, we were able to uh, commercialize the latest Tough Light product, which is the Tough Light 4. Uh, it's an axial fan, uh, the blades of which are made of FRP. Um, and I would like to Kind of go over that design process and some some briefly uh, cover the structural and manufacturing considerations of such fans. And just to confirm, you all can see my screen too, right? Yes, uh, I can see it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so just starting with the brief fundamentals, uh, axial fans. They're also sometimes called uh, as propeller fans. And the, 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 these fans move the air in parallel to the axis of rotation. They are also considered as lower speed and lower pressure fans. Uh, they typically don't exceed anything more than 14,000 uh, feet per minute tip speed. And they typically don't exceed more than one inch of water column in static pressure. They do move large volumes of air uh, because of its sizable area and over system resistance compared to some other fans like uh, centrifugal fans or main axial fans. So uh, in this presentation, we'll start with the aerodynamic design process that we use and also uh, the bulk of the presentation will focus on the aerodynamic design part. Uh, the aerodynamic design is basically the step where you optimize the shape of the fan blade in order to uh, maximize the performance, uh, minimize the power consumption, minimize the noise, etc. The and then we'll briefly talk about the structural design considerations and then uh, manufacturing methods. Why certain uh, manufacturing methods could be preferred in terms of uh, in terms of ensuring the long term reliability of a fan. So, starting with the aerodynamic R and D, uh, as mentioned earlier, the purpose is to uh, design the optimized shape of the fan blade. So, the first step is to make sure that the two D shape, which is the cross section of the blade, is is optimized as well. And and in in terms, when I say optimized, you are trying to get the best or or the max maximum lift to drag ratio of of that airfoil, at a, depending on the particular Reynolds number. And this is exactly what the aircraft engineers or aerospace engineers do when they design the aircraft wing. The only difference is that the lift is acting upwards in a in a in an aircraft compared to a fan, which is acting downwards. So uh, the uh, the first step would be to make sure that the airfoil or the truly shape of the blade is optimized. And there, in in order to do that. Uh, we have to pick the right family first. So, as you can see in this image, there are various families of airfoil depending on the Reynolds number regime that the that the fan or or the airfoil is going to see. So, for example, a Boeing airliner might use the airfoil that looks like this because the typical speed of a Boeing airliner is between Mach point zero point seven to Mach point eight. Uh, that high Reynolds number zone, the optimum shape of the airfoil, it turns out, is it, it looks like this. Versus our fans, our propellers is much lower Reynolds number. So, 
So a, a typical shape of a fan blade, when you look at the cross section, would look like this. Um, and even within this family, there are hundreds of or hundreds of thousands of different airfoils available. So how do you ensure that you pick the the best airfoil for for the Reynolds number that you're looking for? And and in order to do that, we do we employ two ECFD. Of course, it's, it's going to be a, a, a extremely time consuming and expensive effort if you try to win tunnel test each and every airfoil. So uh, since nowadays CFD has become uh, widely available uh, and, and also automated parametric optimization has also become widely available, it's easier to perform CFD analysis and ensure uh, that the airfoil that you pick for a blade is, is optimal. And when I say automated uh, parametric optimization, the, a lot of CFD softwares nowadays can basically done on a macro or, 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 or optimization tool where it will go through all the different airfoils that you have selected and, and run the analysis and give you a Pareto chart that, that gives you the uh, criteria that you have specified. For example, in the airfoil, you're looking for the highest lift, lowest drag, and also the uh, pitch angles at which the, the airfoil will stall. So um, once you have the uh, airfoil selected, you can go on to design the 3D model of the blade. And at, at this point, at this point, you know that the airfoil uh, airfoils that you have selected is is the it's going to give you the best possible lift and the lowest possible drag, uh, which which translates to highest possible airflow generated by the fan and the lowest possible power consumed by the fan. But you also are trying to ensure that the uh, pressure distribution or the velocity distribution across the length of the blade is, is as uniform as possible. If it is not, you will also take a, a, take a hit on efficiency and also increase uh, fan noise. If you just use the airfoil and make a straight blade, and since the, when the fan rotates, it will, the tip of the blade is much faster than the root, the, the pressure distribution or the velocity distribution will look something like this because uh, it's a straight blade and the velocity is decreasing as you go from tip to root. In order to achieve something ideal, which is even or uniform distribution, many fan yeah. manufacturers today employ something like taper and twist, which, which means that the tip of the, of the blade is much narrower compared to the root, and it's also twisted uh, or, or pitched uh, less aggressively compared to the root. Um, and yeah. in, in, in case of Tough Light 4, we also have employed a backward sweep, as you can see in this uh, uh, illustration right here. Uh, we have tried to benchmark this from the aerospace industry. Is if you can, uh, if you have seen a, a jet turbine or or or, or combust com, uh, combustor blade like that, you'll see that there's, there will be a backward sweep to those blades as well. And uh, using this backward sweep, it turns out that uh, it, it helps us a lot, lot in terms of overall fan efficiency and also reducing the fan noise. Hey, Bamek, uh, sorry for the interruption. Could you please uh, speak up to the mic uh, and get closer to the mic? Oh, you're not able to Thanks. hear me? Okay. Now, now it's good. Okay, perfect. So, going forward, um, once we have the, uh, the 3D model of the blade ready, we can start performing the 3D CFD. And uh, even in this uh, 3D CFD, we can use the uh, parametric optimization tools where the software will, will be allowed to change the, the, tape, the code widths, the twist, taper, and, and the sweep, and any other geometric criteria that you specify in order to achieve the best possible performance out of the fan and consume the lowest possible power. And also a lot of this new CFD tools have aeroacoustic models inbuilt, so you can predict the noise of the fan and optimize for that as well. Um, after the CFD analysis is completed uh, and you have a, a, a very optimized design, the next step would be to perform wind tunnel or, or experimental test to validate the CFD. This would help uh, in building confidence of the CFD code. And, and also, uh, for experimental testing, 
the uh, the issue that we face is that the wind tunnels that are available today cannot accommodate a large diameter fan that is typically used in the ACC. Um, so in order to test such fans, we uh, fabricate a much smaller but geometrically similar fans that is tested in the wind tunnel. And, and the wind tunnels that we use is, is basically the AMCA, which stands for Air Movement and Control Association. And they are the inter independent body that 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 certifies the fan performance, the fan noise, and everything for the HVAC industry. So they have a, a long established standards for for testing fans and for uh, predicting fan noise. And once we have the data uh, for the smaller prototype fans, we can scale it up to the full size fan. And and these are the standards that that uh, could be used to perform the test and use the test data to. Uh, to determine the uh, full size test, uh, full size fan performance. So the AMCA 210 is used to determine the procedure for performing the fan test in a wind tunnel. AMCA 301 is used to determine the procedure to perform the noise test, and the 802 is used to uh, uh, translate the data from the wind tunnel test to the full size uh, fan using dimensional analysis and scaling laws. So uh, after performing the uh, the CFD analysis and the wind tunnel testing, we are able to uh, confidently uh, state the benefits of the Tough Flight Four, which was uh, commercialized two years ago, and and, and the the benefits are basically that we we are able to uh, reduce the number of blades, um, and anywhere between two to six, depending on the application, and we are also able to reduce the overall noise produced by the fan between a dB and a half to two dB. The uh, total efficiency of the fan, uh, we were able to increase that by between two and five percent. We were also able to reduce the overall fan weight between 700 to 2500 pounds, depending on the application. And and the reason for such drastic weight reduction is on top of the blade count reduction, we are also using a much smaller fan hub, which is carbon steel, and then contributes to a lot of weight for the fan. Um, we also found that uh, the overall blade pass frequency, uh, I'm sorry, the blade pass frequency vibration that that you all, anybody who's measuring vibration on a fan will know that the blade pass frequency is a, a primary component uh, of vibration. We are able to reduce that significantly uh, and because of the backward sweep. As you can imagine, anything that is stationary above or below the fan uh, and the interaction, the aerodynamic interaction between the blade and that stationary component is what contributes to Blade pass frequency vibration, because the because of the backward sweep of the blade, the entire length of the blade will not go over that stationary component at the same time, which which helps reduce the blade pass frequency vibration. So, uh, moving on to the manufacturing process, uh, we use the RTM method, which is uh, resin transfer molding. And the reason we selected this method for all our fan blade manufacturing is because this is the method uh, which helps us design a single piece or a monolithic blade. Um, if you can imagine uh, what, what we discussed earlier in the aerodynamics R&D is every blade has to have the, the twist taper, and in this case, even the sweep, in order to uh, make the blade as efficient as possible. Uh, Manufacturing process that is extrusion or protrusion, we are not able to uh, efficiently achieve that complex shape. So that this kind of uh, RTM method is able to help us do that, and at the same time, uh, ha ha make sure the blade is single piece, which does not have a, a bolted or adhesive connection. So the manufacturing process for the tough light blades we make is uh, is uh, basically using the mold tool, where the operator will do the hand layup of fiberglass um, and then after the layup is complete we we will basically close the mold and inject air into the center portion where there's a bag inflating and that inflation of the bag and the pressure will uh, make sure that all the fiberglass is pushed to the cavity of the mold forming the shape of the blade once that is complete we'll inject resin inside inside the mold um, at about 130 degrees Fahrenheit, that's the, the temperature where the resin still remains liquid. Once that is achieved, we'll use the temperature control unit to increase the temperature of the mold to around 220, in this case, uh, 
or in, at which temperature the vinyl ester resin that we use will cure and become solid. So that, that's the process we use. And the, once we open the mold, we'll have the uh, solid composite uh, FRP blade. And then we'll do some post-processing on that. Um, so while we are waiting for the manufacturing equipment, uh, we'll of course start with the uh, simulation for FEA to make sure that the fiberglass that we uh, use or the number of layers, the, the type of fiberglass that we use is uh, going to withstand the dynamic forces in the field. And uh, the way we do that is uh, we, the forces, uh, the aerodynamic forces are imported from the CFD software to the FEA software. And we were able to map the, the loads on the blade surface. By doing that, we know how much uh, stress and strain is is uh, is experienced by the blade at each location, and we are able to increase the number of layer or decrease depending on the load, number of layers of fiberglass. Using that, we have an initial estimate of how many layers of fiberglass and what type of fiberglass we need in order to withstand the dynamic loads. Uh, once we have the mold and all the manufacturing equipment, we will start with that layer that the FEA helped us determine and then start doing destructive testing. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. But only after the, the destructive testing is, is successfully completed, we are able to uh, qualify any new blade design, any new structural layup, or any new resin system. So uh, the two types of destructive testing that we do uh, is basically the first one is, uh, is a buckle test, which is used to determine the static strength of the blade. Uh, in the picture, you can see just a cantilever blade, just like how it would be installed in a fan, and we'll apply a static load at the tip of the fan blade. And uh, we have a minimum and, uh, and a maximum criteria where uh, the blade has to withstand a minimum buckle load be before the blade buckles and it cannot deflect more than a maximum value. So either of these two criteria are not met, we go back to the drawing board and add the number of layers, uh, fiberglass layers, uh, depending on uh, how much more strength we need and, and where we need, and we do the same test again. On the endurance test, so once the buckle test is qualified, the next step is to do the endurance test, test where we determine the dynamic strength of the blade. In this case, uh, as you can see in the video, um, we operate only two blades in, in, in a fan, and in this large diameter fan, we have a 200 horsepower motor, which is maximized. That means each blade is using 100 horsepower, which is about four times what you see in a typical application in the ACC. Uh, so this way, we are able to uh, maximize the, uh, the circumferential load on the blade neck. And also in the video, you can see that there are two baffle tables. So every blade will go over the two baffle tables for each rotation. And the baffle tables uh, will help induce an oscillatory vertical force on the blade every time it goes over it. So uh, the combination of these, uh, the circumferential force induced by the extreme horsepower loading and the vertical force induced by the baffle tables, we are able to accelerate the fatigue life of the fan blade. And we have a minimum number of hours that we uh, each blade design or each new layup has to pass in order to be qualified for commercialization. So um, with that, uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me now or feel free to email me or, or call me about fan questions, vibration, performance, anything. Thank, thanks, Bomik. Uh, that's very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question you, you mentioned, and, and it's remarkable that the uh, weight reduction that you have seen uh, between 700 uh, pounds to 2,500 pounds, I believe. On yes, these fans, yes. Wh wh where do you see, wh where do you contribute that uh, reduction? Uh, do you so see- the uh, Majority of the, the reduction blade? is, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say in the blade, uh, Material manufacturing size, uh, shape, and of course the reduction of the hub as well. But what do you, where do you see the most? The uh, most is from the hub. Because the, hub. the reason for that is uh, because the previous generation tough lights used uh, extremely large diameter hubs and a smaller blade. And as you can imagine, the metal, which is carbon, uh, the, the hubs are made of carbon Obvious. steel. 
would be much heavier than the FRP blade. Mm -hmm. And you reduce the number of blades as well. You can as go well, with the, Yes, okay. To reduce the noise, of course. And uh, so now with the with the one one blade, the one piece blade that uh, uh, has been been tested for how long so far? So the single piece blade we have it's been in the market since two thousand two. The Tough Like Three is also a single piece blade, and, okay. and Tough Like Four is a single piece as well. The biggest difference is the surface area of the blade and the backward sweep that you can see. As you can see, this picture right here, it's the, yeah. the blades are swept backwards. On the backwards, but yeah, okay. All right. Uh, we have a question from Gary uh, Mirsky. Uh, go ahead, Gary. Okay. Gary, yes, I'm, we I'm unmuted. Yes. Um, I was wondering uh, what crosswinds you use to analyze the fan blades, because I uh, my my feeling is you get the highest bending stress caused by the uh, crosswinds right so in the in the initial cfd analysis we we haven't uh, introduced a crosswind component for fan performance only but lately i, I understand that a, a lot of customers are experiencing uh, uh, fan failures because of that so we did uh, introduce that and map the forces uh, of such non uniform loading but the good news is that the layup that we have already designed is is able to meet such non uniform loads as well. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. We, yeah, we have thanks, Gary, for this question. We have another question from Jeff Albert. Go ahead, Jeff. I wonder why that is. I wonder where it was the sub. Uh... We couldn't hear you, Jeff. Could you repeat that, please? I don't know. We cannot hear you, Jeff. Try that again. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Jeff's question here. Uh, Jeff was asking, how do you allow for tight tip clearance in actual cooling tower or ACC installation versus test bed uh, that you have in the in the, in the presentation? Tight tip clearance is that? What you say? Yeah, it says tight tip clearance. Okay, I'm not sure if I understand the question exactly, but in uh, if in CFD and also in wind tunnel testing, when we do performance tests there, we try to achieve ideal tip clearance as much as possible. And the and the correction factors that we employ in our selection software is using the uh, the tip clearance clearance ranges specified in API and CTI. So we already have correction factors uh, employed for that for the worst case scenario. For example. A 34 foot fan, according to, I guess it's a CTI standard, the maximum tip clearance should be no more than two inches. So we have already corrected for that. If, if you have a tip clearance more than that, then there would be an exponential performance reduction because of tip leakage. Okay. And, and again, the size of this fan is 36 feet diameter? The, this fan, the maximum diameter is 30 feet, 36 feet, yes. The smallest is 26 feet. 26 and 36, yeah. yeah. So anywhere between 26 to 36 feet is available today. I see. Uh, let's see if we have another question here. That's the only questions we have so far. So uh, uh, maybe uh, anybody is raising their hands. I can't see Scott. Um, I thought I saw Hannes has his hand raised, so he can unmute himself. Okay. Hey, Paramik, thank you for the very, <clears throat> very interesting presentation. Um, yeah. I just had a question with the 
with a backward sweep of the fan, did you find that the, the costs of the molds um, are increased compared to straight, sort of straight blade fans? Um, yeah, uh, it's more to do with the surface area of the blade. It's basically the, um, the machining cost remained the same. It's just the amount of material, the aluminum that we had to use did go up. And that's because the backward sweep created a lot of surface area of the blade. Okay, great. And um, in terms of your fan performance curve, uh, did you get, you know, does it, you know, normally if you design for a specific point, the efficiency might drop off at, at slightly different points, you know, under wind conditions, you might get that the system design curve shifts a bit. Um, do you get good efficiency around the design point or does it drop off sharply or um, oh yeah, are you happy with the design in terms of that? Yeah, I mean, so far we have about 144 fans installed and uh, that counts about 1200 blades uh, in, the, in, the, in the field and we have about a dozen or so tests done as well at site and uh, so far we are really happy with the results. It's matching up with the software, matching up with CFD. Um, the maximum wind speed that we uh, basically don't test, if, if the wind speed crosses above 10 miles an hour, we don't perform the test because that kind of does not relate to, uh, the accuracy of the test is not very good. So, yeah, I mean, uh, as far as we, the, the wind is below 10 miles an hour, uh, the performance is, uh, is really comparable to the software. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions for uh, uh, Balmik? I guess, uh, man, uh, that was perfect. Uh, we are on time here. Thanks, Balmik, for your presentation. Yeah, uh, no we problem. appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, the next presentation is uh, on windscreen, uh, uh, V frame versus A frame. And it's presented by Cosimo Bianchinini uh, from Aragon Research in Italy. Uh, we have uh, Cosimo here, um, is executive at Aragon Research, where he has been working for about nine years as CFD specialist and software developer. Uh, his principal expertise in the, is in the area of computational methods of aerodynamics and heat transfer. Uh, Cosimo graduated in 2007, becoming passionate about CFD during his master's thesis. Uh, he is a winner of a grant to fund a continuation of his research. He obtained a PhD in 2011 at the University of Florence with a thesis on advanced boundary conditions for CFD analysis of heat transfer and aeroquastic uh, and aeroquastics. Uh, Cosimo started studying the aerodynamics of air-cooled condensers in 2015, and since then he has completed numerous projects on mitigation strategy for wind effect on air-cooled condensers, air-cooled heat exchanger and cooling towers aerodynamics uh, 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 aerothermodynamics uh, and their effect on near field equipment. So, Dr. Cosimo uh, Bianchini, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Riyad. <clears throat> this presentation is about uh, uh, a work that we have been uh, doing together with our partners at Babcock and Wilcox and Gatebreaker on the effect or the capabilities of windscreens to mitigate uh, the detrimental effect of wind, uh, both on A-frame and V-frame uh, ACC. So the motivation standing behind this uh, research is related to the fact that uh, uh, the V-frame are uh, intrinsically believed to be more resistant to uh, wind effect um, compared to the standard uh, or more standard A-frame layout. This belief is related to the position of the fan, which is more protected. Um, 
but uh, only a few studies are uh, available in literature so far about the aerodynamics of the um, induced draft ACCs with uh, significant wind. Um, so far, uh, I've seen uh, no uh, comparison which actually are made um, at the same condition for A-frame and V-frame layout to uh, better assess these uh, um, higher resistance to uh, wind effects. Uh, little is known uh, for the, the mechanism that generates loss due to wind for the V-frame layout, uh, in particular the effect of the wind on the flow rate, the fan, and on recirculation. Furthermore, also the effect on large assemblies uh, is not completely understood yet. Uh, in fact, the, the potential for wind mitigation devices for this type of layout is substantially unexplored, and that's uh, motivate our research, which is focused on three main uh, objectives. The first one is to conduct a comparison of the performance for uh, two uh, alternative layouts, the A-frame and the V-frame, with uh, the same nominal uh, capabilities under the same external condition. Uh, this comparison is, will be performed uh, exploiting CFD methodologies, which obviously will be the same for both um, analyses. Uh, the, the example that we, um, that we choose is a, an ACC, is a small ACC with three funds, um, which is selected to be uh, simple enough, but uh, at the same time relevant. Um, the verification uh, is done considering both the delivered flow rate and the recirculation level over the bundle, uh, so that it is possible to understand the loss mechanism uh, due to wind in both layouts. Finally, the focus uh, is on the identification of uh, the wind mitigation, uh, uh, the, the most efficient wind mitigation device for uh, the two, the two configuration uh, under high wind condition. Uh, in practice, we uh, focus on fabric screens uh, with variable porosity which were chosen as the most cost-effective uh, mean to uh, mitigate the, the wind effects. Uh, a list of different windscreen layout will be, were tested for both, uh, uh, for both frames, uh, highlighting several differences in their effectiveness. Okay, the modeling uh, that we use to uh, achieve this um, to complete this analysis is based on a, an established practice uh, which uses uh, commercial CFD software. It's one of the most known, uh, it's named ANSYS Fluent. Uh, the analysis is a steady state uh, um, solution. Uh, we, we model air as an ideal gas with buoyancy forces and uh, uh, the, 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 the actual modeling of the, of the ACC is, uh, um, is implemented with ad hoc sub-models for both the fan and the bundles. The external uh, conditions are specified using a power low wind profile uh, for the far field uh, boundary. So in terms of, of ambient condition, we, we used uh, standard uh, ambient uh, uh, pressure and temperature. Uh, the wind direction was chosen to be inclined with respect to the ACC axis by 45 degrees. This, uh, um, this direction is conventionally associated with the uh, southwest, so that uh, you will see in the next, uh, um, in the next slide the, the way we um, we, we present the, the results. We perform this analysis at two wind speed level, one characteristic for a low wind day, which correspond to one meter per second nominal uh, wind speed, and the other one, which correspond to a high wind day, which uh, is characterized by eight meter per second uh, wind speed. So this is uh, uh, an overview of the of the problem we, uh, we are solving. We have, uh, 
the A frame on the left hand side and the B frame on the right hand side, uh, the, the, the bundles are, um, well, the ACC is obviously um, composed by three different fans. Fan number three is the one that is uh, positioned on the windward side uh, and uh, the bundles have both an upstream side and a downstream side, which we would see later on uh, behaves quite differently in the two, uh, in the two layouts. Concerning the wind profile, um, as we said, a power law uh, expression is imposed uh, in the far field uh, boundary. Uh, the, the Y here is directly the distance from, from ground. Um, the, 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 the two reference velocity were already mentioned are one and eight meter per second. Uh, these conditions were specified at 10 meter above ground, which is the common anemometer height. As an exponent, we use 0 0.2, which is uh, uh, which was proposed in literature for stable boundary layer over rough surfaces. This is a very uh, large sketch of the computational domain. In fact, we have uh, a, a boundary which is the southwest with with uh, uh, imposed uh, velocity profile, as we mentioned. We have um, Opposite to the southwest, we have the northeast boundary, which is a pressure outlet where the, the, the air can, can flow out. The same as what happened on the, on the top of this box, uh, which is pretty large, is in fact uh, uh, almost uh, well half kilometer per half kilometer, uh, and it's 300 uh, uh, meter um, tall. Uh, the, the two sides, the northwest and southeast uh, sides, are actually um, free slip uh, uh, walls, which means that the, the air cannot uh, enter or exit from uh, these sides, but no friction is applied on this. Uh, ground is instead a fully viscous uh, uh, wall. The geometries for the uh, two ACCs considered are depicted here. Uh, in red, we have the bundle surfaces, while in, uh, in yellow, we have the, the fan surfaces. Um, some of the wind walls are obviously uh, made transparent to better uh, understand the inside of the, of the model. Um, Okay, the, the next slides are uh, providing some insights on the sub models that we use. In this case, we are discussing the, the fan model. The fan model is, uh, in fact, a pressure jump, which implements a sudden pressure rise uh, on the thin surface characterizing the, the fan position. Uh, the pressure rise is specified as a function of the normal uh, velocity at the fan, um, at the fan surface. Uh, which is uh, provided by the fan manufacturer. Uh, we use uh, piecewise uh, functions to specify this, uh, um, this behavior, and we extend the, the, the curve towards the, the low uh, flow rates uh, regime uh, to, uh, to also have a stable solution in this uh, uh, in this range as you can see the the two curves for the a frame and v frame are slightly different but substantially uh, have the same type of uh, um, of behavior the, the duty point is slightly higher uh, for the for the v frame in terms of uh, uh, of flow rate as uh, the density is uh, uh, is lower Concerning the bundle, uh, we also use uh, a sudden pressure uh, drop, um, which is specified inside the CFD code as a pressure drop coefficient. So uh, by specifying two different uh, coefficient, K1 proportionality coefficient and an exponent coefficient, uh, we were able to uh, develop um, the, the, the resistance curve for the, for the bundle as a function of the air velocity uh, at the bundle itself. 
the bundle also needs some treatment for the, the thermal behavior. The thermal behavior uh, also consider uh, off design condition. The off design is calculated uh, with a simple um, uh, scaling uh, to the power of uh, Reynolds number to the power of 0 0.8. Uh, as uh, in the very famous correlation by Ditus Bolter. Um, this scaling is applied to the design uh, a transfer coefficient, which is calculated from uh, the, bin, the bundle uh, data sheet according to this, uh, to this picture. In fact, the steam temperature is maintained fixed while uh, the ambient temperature, uh, well, the, the, the local fan temperature will determine the uh, the actual exchanged power. This assumption the, or this type of modeling substantially uh, assume that the, the heat transfer on the on the steam side is much larger than that on the on the air side, and also that the the thermal capacity of the steam is uh, substantially infinite with respect to the uh, to the air capacity to the air thermal capacity. Yes. 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 So um, let's have a look at the, at the results that we obtain before using any uh, wind mitigation devices. You see on the on the bottom left graph the, the mass flow rate delivered by each fan. Uh, the, the mass flow rate is made dimensionsless with respect to the uh, to the expected uh, um, to the expected flow rate. Uh, while on the right hand side, you see the, the recirculation, the percentage recirculation. So um, the, the, the red curve is the V frame, while the, the blue curve is the A frame. If you want to uh, have a look yourself at the, at the results, we, we can see that the, the V frame um, is actually less affected than uh, the A frame by, by the wind effect. Uh, so that the, the performance at eight meter per second are less, um, uh, decrease less compared to, to what we obtain at one meter per second. Uh, at the same time, uh, the V-frame layout is also characterized by higher, um, by higher flow rate at, uh, at one meter per second. On the same, uh, on the other side, the A-frame uh, with respect to recirculation does not suffer at all from uh, recirculation, while the V-frame also at one meter per second is characterized by uh, some uh, uh, nearly 10% recirculation, which is uh, certainly not negligible, achieving values above 20% at eight meter per second. Combining uh, the two uh, effects together, the mass flow rate and the recirculation, we are able to compute the, the cooling potential, which we express as a thermal power. This again is a percentage of the uh, expected uh, uh, performance uh, at the at design. We can see that in total, the V-frame is providing a higher level of cooling than the A-frame at both wind condition. At the low wind speed, the values are comparable. The difference is really uh, below 5%. Uh, while at high wind speed, the difference becomes substantial and the improvement of using a V-frame uh, versus the A-frame uh, can reach nearly 20%. Okay, uh, in this slide, uh, in this slide, we focus on uh, uh, a side effect uh, also uh, uh, without considering any windscreen protection and uh, uh, consider the, um, the different, uh, um, the different uh, um, cooling that is actually provided by the upstream and the downstream bundle. So the graph in itself uh, propose um, report the, the values, the percentage values that we, we obtain for the upstream bundle. So the, the complement to 100 is actually the downstream bundle. And we can see uh, two things. Uh, the first one is that the, the V-frame, um, the V-frame promotes the heat transfer on the upstream bundle uh, as both values are above 50%, while the A-frame promotes the uh, it transfer on the downstream bundle as both values are below 
uh, 50%. The other thing that we, we notice is that at the one meter per second wind speed, both layouts provide uh, an almost uh, uh, equal split between the upstream and the downstream value. Uh, the, the range is between 40 and 60%. Uh, but when the wind increases, this uh, split becomes uh, largely unbalanced. Uh, according to our prediction, 20% uh, of the total power is exchanged on the upstream bundle for the A-frame, uh, which uh, this percentage become even uh, more extreme, uh, up to 5% uh, for the V-frame. Obviously, these, uh, um, these values are affected by the assumption of having infinite uh, heat transfer on the, uh, and heat capacity on the, on the steam side, which obviously is... Uh, um, is an assumption, as we said. So um, this is uh, an overestimation uh, for sure, but it will certainly uh, highlight some uh, uh, trend that uh, must be taken into account. This is uh, a snapshot of uh, the temperature on top and the velocity normal to the bundle uh, uh, on bottom. In the bottom, uh, computed at eight meter per second. On the left hand side, we have the A frame. On the right hand side, we have the the V frame. Um, concerning the, the the temperature, we can see that uh, uh, the the upstream bundle is fully uh, characterized by ambient temperature uh, for the for the V frame, um, while the downstream one is also uh, characterized by some. Uh, um, some uh, recirculation. Uh, concerning the A-frame, we see that uh, uh, we have some uh, backflow uh, or uh, very low heat transfer region here where the, the bundle are characterized by uh, blue uh, region. Uh, and concerning the velocity normal to the bundle, we see that there's a reverse flow where the, the color is red. So namely for the V-frame, uh, on the downstream side, we see some uh, recirculation. Okay. Um, concerning the the windscreen layout, we 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 basically uh, add some uh, um, some experience on the A-frame uh, layout, which uh, um, are normally protected by using uh, ground-based screen or perimeter screens. Um, we had very few ideas uh, concerning what could be uh, efficient for the V-frame, so we had to uh, play um, more with our uh, creativity to propose some, uh, uh, some windscreen layout which was efficient. So, uh, in the next slides, we are presenting the various uh, layouts that we tested. Uh, in this one, uh, we are talking about uh, L01, um, which is uh, uh, a ground-based installation for both uh, configuration. L02 instead is uh, a suspended configuration for both, uh, sorry, for both uh, uh, configuration, as you can see here. Uh, in the next one, we only have uh, the, um, the V-frame, which have more uh, layouts tested. One is an internal screen that divide the upstream and the downstream bundle. Uh, the other one is an horizontal uh, skirt, as we sometimes call it. And finally, we have some variation on vertical screen, which consider uh, only vertical, a combination of vertical and horizontal screens uh, together uh, with the porous and solid uh, uh, screens. Okay, so this is uh, a slide that summarized the results for all the layouts tested with, uh, uh, in terms of mass flow rate. We can see that the ground-based screens uh, show the highest flow rate for bow both uh, uh, frame types. For the V-frame, the, the improvements are actually minor, while for the A-frame, uh, the effectiveness, meaning that the, the recovery of the wind losses is more than 60% of the losses itself. Concerning the, the recirculation, we, we can see here uh, the, the, the graph on the, on, the, on the left is just uh, uh, 
uh, a zoom of uh, what we we have here in a, in the bigger picture, uh, we can see that L01 eliminates the the recirculation for the A frame. Uh, for the V frame, um, the the improvements are not really substantial uh, for the um, in reducing the the recirculation. So we still have a recirculation above fifteen percent with all the tested layouts. Combining the, the two effect, we see that uh, uh, the best layout, uh, meaning the, the one that provides the highest thermal power, is the L01 configuration for the A-frame and a combination of L04 plus L05 for the V-frame, which is the, the cross um, dot uh, in, the, in the graph on the right-hand side. The, the gain that we, we are able to achieve compared to um, L00 performance is 20, plus 22% for the nominal of the nominal thermal duty for the A-frame, uh, but it's only 6% uh, for the V-frame. We will see that, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is the, the, next, uh, the next slide that uh, uh, analyze the same uh, the same results shown in the previous slide, but in terms of uh, windscreen effectiveness. So we can see that the A-frame achieve uh, with L01 an effectiveness close to 60%. Uh, for the V-frame, the effectiveness is only um, uh, slightly above 20%. And this is uh, uh, an explanation of why the L04 plus five is more uh, is more capable of uh, uh, reducing the, um, the recirculation and improving the, the performance so that the, the, the region uh, right behind the, the V-frame ACC is characterized by a lower, um, a lower uh, hot air uh, region thanks to the lower uh, recirculation zone, which do not interact with, uh, with the plume. Um, this is uh, the, the, the summary of, uh, uh, of our investigation and uh, takes uh, into account uh, the, the no screen configuration in, in blue together with the best uh, screen um, highlighted by this uh, uh, analysis and consider just the high wind um, condition. The results are reported as a percentage of the of the thermal power with respect to the to the design uh, um, to the design uh, case, so um, we can see that without the windscreen, we already highlighted this in the preliminary slides. The V frame is actually able to provide a much larger uh, amount of cooling uh, than the A frame. In particular, the the difference is about thirty three point six percent. With the screen uh, implementing the best layouts for both configuration, uh, the V-frame is still capable of uh, uh, exchanging more uh, heat, uh, but the difference is becoming negligible as uh, it is only 1.1% uh, more than the A-frame. So to conclude our analysis, we performed uh, a CFD analysis to um, compare the thermal performance of uh, a small ACC uh, equipped with uh, uh, an A-frame layout or a V-frame layout. Um, the, the ACC is a three cell in a single street arrangement and the, the investigation was uh, conducted by, by means of CFD as you uh, now know. The study uh, was focused on quantified the, the resistance to wind of the two layouts and uh, the capability of the windscreens to, to increment such resistance to wind uh, was further investigated to uh, provide uh, optimal windscreen solution um, for both uh, layouts, which possibly uh, were different as in fact they were. The comparison for the A-frame and the V-frame layout shows that uh, at low wind speed, the two frameworks work similarly. We both uh, realize performance above 90% of the nominal thermal power. Uh, 
under these, the given condition, actually the V-frame was better performing by nearly 5%, but this was considered uh, negligible. In terms of uh, um, um, upstream and downstream bundle, we saw that the A-frame favors the heat transfer on the downstream bundle, while the V-frame favors the upstream bundle. Uh, anyway, the split is close to 60 to 40 in, uh, in percent in both cases. Uh, at high wind speed, the performance drops significantly for both the, the layouts. However, the performance reduction is much higher for the A-frame, uh, which achieve nearly 40% of the losses due to wind. Uh, the the V-frame is affected by, by wind only in terms of recirculation, in terms of flow rate, we, we saw substantially no uh, deficit. The advantage for this layout in a multi-street uh, uh, layout uh, should be confirmed by dedicated analysis, which are uh, ongoing. Uh, the windscreen design shows that uh, um, it, it is possible to improve the performance for both frameworks. For the A-frame, uh, the ground-based screen recover nearly 60% of the wind losses. For the V-frame, um, the, the top mounted screens combining horizontal and vertical screens uh, recover 22% of the wind losses. At the end, implementing the, uh, the best uh, layout for both frameworks, uh, it was possible to achieve uh, almost the same level of performance for um, the V-frame and the A-frame together. So this was my last slide. Thank you, Cosimo. Uh, appreciate that. That's very interesting. Uh, CFD study here uh, on the A frame versus the V frame. Um, I have a question on the model that you show. Uh, I, I understand that you're trying to compare the two uh, with the same conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, question on the fan bell for the mm -hmm. A frame. Uh, did you use the same height? fan bell on the V-frame as well in your model? Um, well, no, the, the, the fan bell is different, is uh, substantially reversed. Uh, right, or, but it's the height, the height of that. The, the, the height is approximately the same, but it's yeah. um, it refers to, to, to a different design, so they're not exactly the same. Right, but, they, uh, but uh, the same height. As far as the relative uh, from the fan blade to the tip of that uh, fan shroud or fan bell to the top of it, is it the same? So, um, can you say it again? Sorry. Okay. The, the so, height so from the height, ground, you mean? No, the height from the fan, the the fan plane to mm -hmm. the top of the uh, fan bell. Yeah. Is it the same that you used on the V-frame versus the low side of the fan bell on the A-frame to the fan? Okay, they're, they're not exactly the same. No. They're not the same, okay. But but the overall height of the fan bell is uh, looks the same, right? Yeah, uh, it's similar. Okay. It's very okay. similar. Yeah. Okay. Do Do you think? Did you look at where the fan bell, if it is on the V frame, is taller? Okay. Mm -hmm. That of course will reduce the circulation. Did you look into that? Uh, yeah. No, not in this. Uh, not in this project. Uh, as okay. the the um, the focus was on uh, uh, substantially on a retrofit solution. I and think. not on a uh, uh, different uh, design uh, um, uh, to be considered uh, during the, 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 the actual installation of the ACC. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we have another sure. uh, a question here. Um, uh, it's a question from uh, Bob. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Um, Bob Schweiger, you have a question? Yeah, does the A-frame have a capital cost advantage over the V-frame design or vice versa? 
Okay. Um, I need uh, I need help to <clears throat> sorry to to reply to this question as I'm uh, uh, I will, I'm not involved in the costing uh, for these two layouts. So I don't know if somebody from uh, Babcock and Wilcox want to to reply in spite of me if this is allowed, or otherwise they uh, can prepare a reply for the discussion. At the end of the on. session yeah usually uh bob to answer your question generally speaking the construction of the v frame is less expensive than the a frame but uh, I, i'm not sure about the exact cost or you know the, uh, the comparison between the two but usually it the, the reason they uh, uh they came up with the v frame is the uh, reduced construction cost yeah, I think this is a general consideration, but perhaps the question was more related to this uh, single street layout. Oh. I don't know. Yeah. So um... uh, I saw a written question concerning the the height of the windscreens. If I if I'm not wrong, so I guess this slide reply to this question. Yeah. Am I right, Riyadh? Uh, I don't see the, the 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 chat. I just saw the the notification before. Yeah. Well, uh, what uh, Albert, what Jeff is saying here is that yeah, the higher the uh, the fan stack uh, on the V frame, uh, you know, would be taller and and gaining some uh, velocity recovery. So, which is uh, suspect. So that's correct. Yeah. Um, here we have a question from Raghu. Um, go ahead, Raghu. Yes, so I was just wondering about the height for the L05 configuration. Uh, it seems like it's 8,000 millimeters. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. I didn't uh, indicate that they are millimeters, but definitely they're not kilometers. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yep, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then what, what, what about the L4 configuration? Like you said, you put it in the horizontal orientation. So the, the, it's this one, six meter and, uh, and four. So it, it will be on the ends, right? Okay. If, if you have multi street configuration, I assume it's on the ends, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your questions. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Cosimo, for this interesting uh, presentation. Uh, Thank we you. Appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna move on now to uh, the last uh, presentation today. Uh, we go uh, to performance comparison between the co-current and counterflow ACC tubes, and uh, and presented by uh, William Devi uh, from Exponent USA. Uh, Bill, Dr. Bill Devi, Devi uh, is a senior engineer in exponents thermal science practice, uh, practice in Natick, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Devi uh, specializes in solving problems related to fluid flow and heat transfer using using both exponential and computational analysis. This includes failure analysis of energy infrastructure, such as uh, condensers and pipelines, in addition to failures of uh, HVAC equipment, appliances, uh, and consumer electronics. Uh, prior to joining Exponent, Dr. Devi was uh, a research assistant at the University of Illinois, where he studied air-cooled condensers Using, using both experimental and modeling techniques. Uh, his primary focus was investigating the effect of steam flow and condensation on thermal performance uh, of tubes with elongated cross sections. Uh, Dr. Davis is uh, a licensed professional mechanical engineer in California. Dr. Davis, uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Riyadh, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. So 
little bit of background information. Bill, you're a um, if, if you go into the audio or video menu up at the top, and choose your speaker and microphone settings, if you just You see that menu? Hear me okay now? No, it's pretty low. Um, you know where your microphone is? All right, so now you see the microphone. Can everyone hear me okay now? Yeah, we can hear you, but uh, it's kind of still low. Audio and video menu up at, uh, menu item up at the top next to view. Are you there, Bill? Scott, can you hear me better now? No, it's still really low. Um, can you call in?
Billy, are you there? Uh, yes. Can you hear me now, Scott? Yes, sir. Much better. All right. Please. Sorry about that, everybody. Let me get my presentation back up. Yeah, Bill, just take the time you need. Uh, we go, we'll be going into the discussion. That's fine. All right. All right. And we're back. Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, glad it's working all right now. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit of experimental work. Uh, mainly looking at the performance of actually the inside of the tubes, looking at what goes on with the condensate inside these tubes, and looking at the difference between uh, co-current and counter-flowing tubes. So we'll first look at visualization inside the tubes, and then talk a little bit about how this affects the cooling performance. And then I'll finally touch on just briefly about the pressure drop on the steam side. So as I mentioned, I'm an, currently an engineer at Exponent in Natick, Massachusetts. Um, but most of this work was actually performed when I was in grad school at the University of Illinois. So I'd like to acknowledge them. And it was performed at the Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Center. So what I'm going to be looking at today is A-frame air-cooled condensers with flattened steel tubes. So this design you see here, where the majority of the tubes are co-current configuration. So when I say co-current, I mean you have vapor coming in at the top and flowing downwards, and your, con your liquid condensate as it condenses is also flowing downwards and coming out the bottom. And that's opposed to uh, counter-flowing tubes, which would be in this design maybe about 20% of the tubes, where you have the remaining vapor that isn't condensed coming out of these downward flowing tubes will go flow upwards in these counterflowing tubes and condense. So you have in these tubes, you have vapor flowing upwards, as you can see here, and then that condensing liquid flowing back downwards and actually no outlet at the top. These will be the counterflowing tubes. A few differences you'll see with my experiments is the exit quality of my downward co-current flowing tubes is about zero. So I'm actually condensing most of the vapor inside of them. And I'll have an array of fans instead of one axial fan at the bottom, but I keep the air velocity relatively um, close to operating pressures. And the experimental pressures I worked with don't quite go down to the same high vacuum you see in an operating condenser, going down to a maximum of about half an atmosphere. And the main questions I've been looking at in this is, are the liquid flow patterns similar between co-current and counterflowing tubes? And then as a result, how does this affect the cooling capacity and are the cooling capacities the same, you know, different between these co-current and counterflowing tubes? Then along with that, I've also actually looked at the effect of tube inclination and how that, so the inclination angle of this tube versus horizontal and how that affects the performance. So first of all, look a little bit at the visualization. So to start, I'll show a long 10.7 meter long tube. And for this tube, I actually cut it in half along the entire length. So taking this cross section, I cut off half of the cross section and replaced it with a polycarbonate window. So we could actually see the flow of condensate and vapor along the entire length of tube. So that was put in an air duct. And you can see after I've cut off half of the tube, you can see the opening. This is before I covered it with polycarbonate. So it would actually be able to visualize the flow along the entire length. And this was performed just on a co-current tube. And this gives kind of a good overview of how the flow pattern is for these tubes. So this is just a picture of my facility. The, we had connected up to a, to a forklift here so we could lift it up at different inclination angles. So this is the 10.7 meter long tube at 30 degrees, then at 75 degrees here. And just looking at an overview of how the flow pattern arranges itself, you can see so vapor is coming in at the inlet and flowing along the axis. And as it condenses, it's basically falling downwards with gravity and collecting along the bottom of this tube. And then that liquid condensate kind of flows out the bottom like a, as a river flow. So you can see here, 
the, around halfway down the tube, you have about one centimeter of liquid condensate collected along the bottom of the tube. And if we get closer to the bottom of the tube, the, the depth of condensate has increased to about two centimeters and the velocity has increased significantly. But we can see the flow pattern is basically stratified. So all this liquid is basically collecting along the bottom of the tube for the entire length. And then if we look at a higher inclination tube, so this is at 75 degrees inclination, we're gonna see the same basic flow pattern and this is at the bottom of the tube. The main difference are you're gonna see a higher velocity of liquid at the bottom of the tube. And as a result, you can see a slightly thinner depth of this liquid at the bottom of the tube because it's flowing at higher velocity. So you need a less cross-sectional area to get that same amount of liquid coming out of the tube. As you can see, the majority of the tube, even here at the bottom, after most of the vapor is condensed, the majority of the tube is actually still filled with vapor. So then to compare co-current and counterflowing tubes, I looked at just 5.7 meter long tubes, much shorter. And for these, I didn't cut them in half. So I had a fully intact pristine tube that I placed in an air duct. And as you can see, this air duct had an array of axial fans along the length. So instead of one large axial fan at the bottom, like you'd have in an operating A-frame condenser, you have this array of fans. This allows us, allowed me to get the uniform air velocity along the entire length. That really lets me isolate the effects of um, and understand what's happening inside the condenser tube without having any variable airflow on the outside. And for both the co-current and counterflow, a very similar experimental setup. And once again, I could adjust the inclination angle to see the effects of inclination angle on the flow of liquid inside. So this is once again for co-current tubes. And this is a very low angle, two degrees. So although this is what you normally see in an operating condenser, it allows the amount of condensate buildup to be greater and allows us to visualize a little better what we see inside the tube. And so this is at the inlet of the tube. So at the vapor inlet, we see the, almost the entire tube is filled with vapor and there's almost no liquid built up at the bottom. But as you can see, these droplets are collecting along the wall and falling down to the bottom. So this is a, window we had at the inlet and outlet just so we can visualize the flow. So then if we look down at the outlet, we see basically quiescent liquid along, collected along the bottom. So as with the longer tube, we have the same configuration of vapor filling most of the tube and stratified liquid along the bottom, building in depth as we increase down the tube. So then if we look at a counterflowing tube, you know, how does that defer? Or does that defer? So if we look this is at the vapor inlet and the liquid outlet, so the bottom of the tube. We have vapor coming in here and then condensate flowing out down the bottom. We'll see that once again, vapor fills up most of the tube and we have liquid filling up the bottom and it's basically quiescent. We don't see waves or anything along the top, even though we have vapor flowing in the opposite direction. And so if we look at the top of the tube, Looking in, so here, because we had closed off the top of the tube, we can actually look directly in the end. And looking in the end of this tube, what we're gonna see is no buildup of liquid along the bottom. So we're just gonna see the vapor that had basically condensed locally, had fallen down, and we have just very local thin film of liquid. So what that gives us for the entire tube is basically the same configuration of liquid that we saw with the co-current flowing tube. So although the vapor is flowing in the opposite direction, the liquid actually takes the same, the same geometry. Very little liquid at the top and building up when we get to the bottom. So this is for a tube inclined at 20 degrees. So although this is lower than you see an operating condenser, we consider this representative of any condenser inclined greater than this height. And we pick this because as we get lower, you actually need to see a difference with the liquid flow. So as we decrease this inclination angle to five degrees, we actually start to see a slight buildup of liquid at the bottom of the condenser tube. And the reason we see this liquid buildup is because vapor is actually pushed the condensate up towards the end of the tube. So this is what we call the onset of flooding. So at this point, we have a sim very similar configuration of liquid with the difference that the depth of liquid at the top of the tube is slightly higher. So we're actually retaining a little more, more liquid in the entire tube at this point. So for the conditions we looked at, so this was at 
90 kilopascal, slightly below atmospheric pressure, this point was five degrees. You could see this point being slightly at a slightly higher inclination angle if you have uh, a much either higher capacity tubes or uh, lower operating pressure. And as we decrease that inclination angle more, this is at 1.5 degrees, we see that amount of liquid at the bottom of the tube increases. So the amount of flooding increases. This is at 0 0.5 degrees. We see a much more significant amount of liquid, as you expect. So we're nearly a horizontal tube. So putting these all aligned next to each other, we can see that the depth of condensate at the 20 degree tube, we have no condensate at the top. And then if we move to down to five degrees, we start to see actually some liquid at the top of the tube, and that increases as we're lowering the inclination angle of the tube. So this is the uh, the geometry we see when the tube starts to experience flooding. So looking at overall comparison of condensate depth, so this is a tube inclined at 30 degrees inclination. We see no difference of condensate depth at the top and bottom of the tube for co-currents, which is the circles versus counter flow. So despite the difference in vapor flow direction, we see the same liquid flow pattern. And then if we move to a five degree inclined tube, we see that actually the same depth of condensate at the bottom of the tube, but the top of the tube for the five degree tube, because we have some flooding for the counter flow, we see slightly increased depth of condensate there. So a slightly greater amount of condensate retained in the tube for the counter flowing tube. All right, so now that we know how the liquid arranges itself, we can look at how that actually affects the cooling performance of these tubes. So this is looking at co-current tubes, and I have instrumented these tubes across the cross, I mean, along the cross section. So this is looking at one cross section around halfway down the tube. And I have thermocouples inserted, uh, embedded in the steel wall going up the tube. And I measure air temperature at both the inlet and outlet. And I also have thermocouples inserted inside the tube so I can actually measure the steam temperature. And from this, we can actually see the cooling performance along the cross section, along the air path of the tube. So looking at this, we see the air temperature difference Sorry, the temperature difference between air and steam coming into the tube is about 50 degrees Celsius at the bottom, and that decreases to just over 10 degrees Celsius at the air outlet. And as a result of this large temperature change in the air, we see a large temperature change in the wall. So at the bottom, the wall temperature is below 90 degrees Celsius, so around a 10 degrees the temperature difference between the wall in the liquid inside, in the sorry, the vapor inside. However, by the time you get halfway up the tube wall, that temperature difference is nearly gone. So as a result, what we see is that the majority of the heat flux, the majority of the cooling of the condenser tube happens in the bottom half of this tube. So 75% of the cooling capacity of this condenser is actually in the bottom half of this cross section. And the top half half of this cross section only can down to about 25% of the cooling capacity. So this is for co-current. If we move to counter flow, looking at that same cross section, we see very similar performance. So once again, we see the by far the lowest wall temperature at the bottom of the tube. And by halfway up that tube, that wall temperature difference has almost disappeared. And as a result, about 75% of the cooling capacity of the condenser happens in the bottom half of that tube. So once again, due really to the same geometry of condensate, we see a very similar cooling performance between counterflow and co-current flowing tubes. So then if we look at the over -perform overall performance of these tubes, these are for tubes inclined at 20 degrees. We can see the cooling capacity between co-currents, which is the solid shapes, and counterflow, which is the um, 
open shapes is is equipment. And that holds for different air steam temperature differences and for different air velocities. And while there might be some, you might seem surprising from the start, as we've seen with the condensate geometry, there really is no strong difference inside the tube. So if you have the same air configuration, you're going to see a very similar cooling capacity. There is one difference we can note, however, and that's if we look at the effect of tube inclination angle. So this is the cooling capacity of these condenser tubes plotted versus the tube inclination angle. And what we can see is that for the counterflow tubes, as the tube inclination angle decreases below 20 degrees, and we start to see flooding in the tubes, an increase in retained condensates, what we see is a reduction in capacity of quite significant, around 10% at the lowest inclination angles. So this shows that if you're retaining more condensate in the tubes, you're actually going to reduce the capacity of those tubes. And this holds for uh, across all air uh, velocities tested, both two meters per second and two and a half meters per second. When we get to the point where we're retaining extra condensate in the bottom of the tubes, we are reducing the capacity of those tubes. And the reason for this is particularly the location where we're retaining liquids. So as we saw before, when we start flooding the tubes, we're actually retaining extra liquid on the bottom of the tubes. This picture at the bottom here. And because we're retaining liquid at the bottom of the tubes, and the majority of our heat flux is happening at the bottom of the tube here, we're actually having a significant effect on the cooling performance of the tubes. So for the non-flooded tube, we have very high internal heat transfer coefficient along the entire cross-section of the tube. But when we retain extra liquid here at the bottom, we're actually reducing that internal heat transfer coefficient. We have this liquid here that's uh, preventing condensate di condensation directly along the, the tube wall. As a result, we're reducing our condenser U value at the very bottom and reducing heat flux at this most important area at the bottom of the tube. So that's why flooding, although we're not retaining a large amount of condensate, will have a significant effect on the overall cooling capacity of these tubes. All right. And last, I just wanted to touch a little bit on pressure drop in these tubes. So this is steam side pressure drop, internal pressure drop. And if you look at a tube inclined horizontally, we see a similar pressure, the same pressure drop between co-current and counterflowing tubes. However, as we increase the tube inclination angle, we see a very significant difference in the effect on pressure drop. So for co-current tubes, as we increase that tube inclination angle, the pressure drop decreases. And for counterflowing tubes, as we increase the tube inclination angle, the pressure drop increases. And the reason for that can be understood by looking at all the components of pressure drop. So looking at this bottom chart on the bottom left, we can see the components of the total pressure drop include the frictional pressure drop, so the friction between the vapor and the wall or the condensate along the wall. Then we have the gravitational pressure drop, which is the hydrostatic pressure that we're overcoming or that's helping us, and the momentum pressure drop of the de decreasing velocity of that steam as it moves through the tube. And we can see for the co-current tubes, the total pressure drop decreases largely because, as the inclination angle increases, largely because we have the benefits of gravity. As we're tilting that tube downwards, we have the weight of all the liquid and vapor in the tube helping us push the flow downwards. So that's something very simple that gives us the benefits. We also have an added small benefits of decreased frictional pressure drop because we're retaining less condensate in that in those tubes. As you're tilting downwards, as we saw earlier, you're decreasing the amount of liquid in the tubes. It's flowing out faster, so you have less friction between that liquid and the vapor. So between those two effects, you're getting a lower total pressure drop as we increase that tube inclination angle. For co-current, 
I don't have experimental results, but this is just from our model. The effect is really opposite. So as we increase that tube inclination angle, we're going to have to fight gravity more. So you're going to have to overcome the hydrostatic weight of the vapor and the liquid in the tube as we're flowing upwards. So as you're increasing those tube inclination angle, we're going to have greater pressure, internal pressure drop on these counterflowing tubes. We have a slight reduction in frictional pressure drop because we have retaining less liquid, but that's really overcome by the effect of the gravitational pressure drop. So as a result, for tubes operated at uh, at normal operating inclination angles around 60 degrees, you're going to see a difference between the counterflow and the co-current tubes. So in summary, the co-current and counterflowing tubes have similar flow patterns of liquid and similar condensate accumulation, with the exception of co counterflowing tubes at low inclination angles can experience flooding. And as a result, co-current and counterflowing tubes have equivalent capacities at typical inclination angles we'll see in operating condensers. However, as we saw, if you do have flooding in counterflowing tubes, you will have reduction in capacity. An added thing we saw is that the co-flowing counting the co-current and counterflowing tubes have the highest heat transfer at the air inlets, which is the bottom of the tube cross section, uh, accounting for about 75% of the heat transfer it's in that bottom half of the tube. And then finally, if we look at pressure drop, the co-current pressure drop decreases as tube inclination angle increases, and for counterflowing tubes, the pressure drop increases as tube inclination angle increases. So that's it. I'd just like to acknowledge my, the team at University of Illinois and Dr. Pega Herniak, who provided the facilities to do this work. And that's all I have. So happy to take any questions or discussion. Thanks, Dr. David. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, it's, uh, it's good to see a actual testing results and you know data that you have. Uh, thank you. That um, do we have any questions? I couldn't see Scott. Is somebody raising their hands? Yeah, uh, it's Barry. I have a I have a question. Um, yes. It's it's obviously uh, Bill. This is obviously not my area. If you were with us yesterday and listened to all the. Uh, important uh, uh most important failure mechanisms that take place in accs and uh, and so i relate that to what you've indicated and i don't i didn't hear anywhere where you mentioned about deposition so you know as you have the two uh, as you have the two phase mixture going into the tubes then that's the most susceptible area at the tube entries as you saw yesterday and that's where uh, two phase fac takes place uh, due to the turbulence at the entry. And then we know from our understanding of FAC that almost immediately uh, the, the, the corrosion products, which are soluble and particulate, deposit downstream of that. And so, as you've probably seen, as you take out an ACC or you look in an ACC tube, it's, um, it's thoroughly it's thoroughly um, deposited, you know, on the surface, and that and that must change the heat transfer coefficient. And so, when you have, we know that you know that when you get past that tube entry, you've got annular flow or, or laminar flow or whatever whatever you guys call it. But you get that, but that that is also um, uh, susceptible to that to that deposition that takes place. And I didn't hear anything in your presentation about deposition, but that must surely have a have quite a major effect to the performance because of the heat transfer coefficient. Yeah, so actually all these results were uh, performed with a corroded tube. I can show some pictures here. So the, these results will hold for a, a corroded tube if you look you can look here, uh, where do I have? Yeah, here you can see, I mean, this is a well-rusted tube. And 
although I, I guess the corrosion products will decrease the heat transfer coefficient, the, the conduction through the steel is really is really minimal compared to uh, the really the two components of the heat transfer that you have to look at are the air side and the liquid. So I don't think, although you will have maybe a difference in corrosion along the tube length, I don't think it will be as significant as your differences in airflow and your differences in liquid buildup. Yeah. Because really that's so Bill, I think you, I think you understand. I think you understand if you listen to yesterday that all the corrosion takes place at the tube entry. There's basically there's basically not sufficient turbulence uh, down down the tube because of the annular flow situation for corrosion to take place past that tube entry. So it's um, very interesting, very interesting situation. Maybe maybe in the future you can include. Uh, the deposition rate on onto these tubes because when because when we look down them and we have boroscopes we clearly see lots of deposits uh, on them and the only place they come from in two phase two phase FAC situations is 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 right from those tube entries. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting to look at for sure. Just, yeah, for mine, I was generally uniformly corroded along the length. If you need any help, just get back to me because we we have probably the biggest database. Of, of of tubes in ACC, and uh, if you need any help or clarification, just uh, just let me know. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to discuss more. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Barry, for the question. Um, and uh, any other questions for Dr. Devi? Uh, looks like uh, this is it, Dr. Davies. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, now uh, we turn our focus on the discussion session, Andy. Right? Yes. We, we can uh, we can start the discussion. Uh, I think uh, Richie asked question during one of the presentation. And it could be um, used here as far as the uh, end uh, users. What did we have, Riyadh? From uh, did we have any questions that remain unanswered here? Yes, uh, we have uh, one question. Uh, Richie was asking if any of the users uh, have a V-frame uh, that are participating on the conference that to give us some uh, feedback. Yeah, so the reason I asked that is all of our ACCs are all A-frame. And then at one of the plants in uh, Northern Nevada, one of the problems that they face is like the high crosswinds. Um, they speeds are up to 25 miles per hour and then during summer we're not able to get you know enough heat transfer across the ACC where where there's you know we have a D rate on our units and I was wondering if the V frame resolves that issue I mean it looks like it does but do you run into issues with low wind speed then with uh, re recirculation. So, do any of the users have a V-frame and then do you run into issues with low, uh, low wind speed? Well, I'm aware of about three uh, V-frames in the US. I'm not sure what might be elsewhere. And I'm not sure if any of those uh, those operators or users are attending. But there may be some others who have been involved yeah. with them. I think the next uh, 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 in person conference, uh, we will be visiting uh, Richie, those uh, plants with uh, V frame, right? And we'll have a closer look at them and and uh, communicate with the users 
firsthand. Well, so you could save your question for a year, or I could put you <laughs> in touch with someone right away. Okay. <laughs> I had a question, uh, Hannes. I'm thinking you're still on rather than uh, getting late into your evening. I don't know. I had a question about the nat natural draft uh, ACCs just I know you, you tour, we talked a little about that a year ago. Um, what's your status and direction with uh, looking into those? I just kind of thought you might expand a little on that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so we only actually, we have a research student or master student that started this year. Uh, they do coursework for the first six months and he's actually only just started really with his thesis work, uh, although it's, it's going well. Um, so, yeah, so we aim to, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, we aim to try and first do like a 1D model just to understand the basics and fundamentals um, and look at a bit of a sensitivity analysis on what factors affect the natural draft ACC. Um, then thereafter we'll do CFT studies and then try and compare it to previous work done on natural draft ACCs and maybe indirect cooling towers as well to see the effects of wind on that system. As I mentioned, my expectation is that that system is less sensitive to wind conditions compared to echo condensers. Um, and from there, we'll take it forward and look at a bit more um, complex, complex topics um, like transient effects and so forth, which some guys have started to look at. Um, as I mentioned, maybe I can just mention for my colleagues, maybe who are online, we, there's also some research that's been done on, on our side for this A-frame versus V-frame configuration and the effects of low and high speeds um, on, on those configurations, which once it's published, uh, we can obviously share. Good, thanks. I'll uh, also remind you all, this is a uh, design and performance session. If you have any, any questions or concerns or would like to uh, communicate any issues you have with, with performance in particular uh, for operating systems, that this is a good opportunity to ask those questions. Yeah, uh, Andy, I, I, have a, uh, I have a question. I don't know whether it's for, for Pretorius. Or, or for for somebody else, but just a general just a general comment. Uh, everybody saw yesterday how the main concern in ACC is the iron that's generated and uh, transported around the cycle, and uh, and and not only an ACC problem but a total unit problem. And um, I noticed in uh, Hannah's. Uh, uh, presentation, lots of research activities, but nothing on the tube entries. And I wondered whether he had any comment about, uh, you know, about that in terms of Riyadh, in terms of cross fertilization of these little groups that we that we artificially have in uh, in ACC UG. I wondered if there was any uh, any work that could be done. And, and Hannah, uh, you may not know, but in the, in other fields, in in uh, in the HRSGs, which are very often connected to um, to these ACCs, uh, you know, 20 years ago there was the same problem where there was a geometrical effect that was causing that was causing turbulence and resulting in ACs and resulting in FAC. So we have the same thing here, but there's basically been no change whatsoever in in the design of the tube entries. Uh, and also the cross members, you know, it seems in, inherently wrong to have surfaces that are perpendicular to two phase flow. And, uh, and there must be, uh, must be some way that you can make it like a, you know, a blackbird airplane or something that, that, that would, that would prevent this. And so I wondered whether uh, you or anybody else had any, any comment on on you know the research that's needed, it's it's really the prime area in an ACC, causing you know not only in the ACC but in the whole plant. Just a comment, maybe it maybe you have maybe you have a reciprocal comment. Yes, so I think um, maybe to start off with, uh, I can say that I I haven't thought about that in much detail. 
um, in terms of research, but it is an interesting thing that you raise. I, I you know, I was always, you know, except for the for the sort of impingement of, of water droplets on the cross members, uh, I was always thinking that the FAC is more of sort of a, chem, a chemical problem. Um, so maybe that was my my mistake. Uh, I I know from from the Matimba plant, which which GA built in the sort of 80s, 90s, they, the, the, the tubes connect directly to the bottom of this round steam distribution duct. And uh, I think in an effort maybe to, to try and alleviate some of the high velocities in this area, the, the newer plants like Medupi incorporate a, a sort of a box, a box down from the, um, from the steam distribution duct, I think to, to lower the velocities. Um, so, so from the results I've seen yesterday uh, from Cabello or Sabelo, um, from from the, the speaker from from Adupi, um, I'm not sure whether he, you know whether there's whether he can comment on whether there's an improvement between the timber on that side. Um, so so Hannes, yeah, thanks. Thanks. You probably you probably know that I did the uh, I did uh, much of the original work uh, in Escom uh, before Madupi and and Kusili. And, uh, you know, there's basically no difference in the design now. And so when we look at FAC and I can provide you papers, you know, we've written reviews on this, but, um, you know, the, you have two features, you have the chemistry factor and you have the geometrical factor. So the chemistry is the thing that drives it, but the location of it is, it, it, it is where the turbulence takes place. And uh, in, other, in other generating systems, we've been able to get rid of that. Uh, of that turbulence and that and you know that's basically that's basically what's needed here so i want to offer to you from accug that if you need any help or you would like to focus on some uh, on on one of the biggest problems then just get back to me uh, and uh, we can provide you with uh, with the information that's needed we can provide you the information on fac uh, you know what, 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 whatever you want, but it just seems that I've, uh, I've listened to Riyadh's excellent, excellent session here on all the things, but but it's missed out on these really important aspects. Okay, no, thank you for the offer. That's um, that's definitely something to think about, uh, and and maybe something that we could evaluate, you know, with CFD or some some sort of a uh, analysis, an analysis, yeah. Thank Thank you. I, th I think I'm sharing a, a slide from a presentation I'll have tomorrow. Um, in case some of you don't make it tomorrow, I thought I'd just show it. But but this shows the the cross members. Uh, the steam is the flow is going away from us directly toward those cross members. You can see that underneath uh, there's some interactions that go on directly underneath the the flow. The steam flow is diverted down. There's a large amount of turbulence and and right under cross members or bars that happen to may happen to be their support bars. Uh, yeah. This is where the 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 uh, design could have an influence on on yeah. what happens. So yeah. So Andy, Andy, this is not only to Hannah's. I, I, I'm just using him. Sorry, Hannah's, uh, as uh, as uh, as a reason to bring up this discussion because it's the major thing in ACCs that's not been addressed. And you can look uh, at this slide from Andy. You can look at similar slides that we've shown for the last 20 years and see exactly the same thing. And we still do not know whether these cross, whether the damage on the cross members are due to liquid droplet impingement, as I showed you yesterday, to the larger droplets, you know, like 20, 30, 40 microns in size, as compared to the damage that's causing the, uh, at, the at the tube entries, which is, as I showed you yesterday, less than a micron. And um, and so it's really it's really an important aspect, and we and we and you know I, I'm you can easily make these cross members uh, pointed in the direction of flow, just like I said, like a blackbird aeroplane, and so it would be very good. And it seems like an ideal situation for a university, Hannah's, you know, that we've done lots of work in before. That you know you could you could set this up and, uh, and model it. But again, if you need any help, just let me know. No, thank you. Larry. I think that's a good idea. Maybe just something that I can mention is, you know, it, it also takes eventually the contractor to 
you know, you know, if it's a very fancy aerodynamic shape, you know, he needs to minimize his costs. So if he doesn't think there's a problem, um, you know, he might just stick with a round or a square section. So, but I mean, from a university's perspective, we can certainly have a look at it. Yeah. And there's lots of, uh, Hannah's, there's lots of IAPS um, interest, uh, you know, throughout the ESCOM organization and, and in the other companies in South Africa that I've worked with that are very interested in that. And so I'm sure we could get them to support us if we needed to. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Riyad, sorry, but I thought that was a, an important overall thing to, to, to raise. Yeah, it is, uh, and it's an opportunity for Dr. Uh, Hansi to, uh, to explore later on and, uh, and, you know, opportunity for new research, I guess, uh, to uh, resolve, find a solution for this problem. So, thanks for bringing that up. Appreciate that. Any other discussion or uh, yeah. questions? I was trying to to ask Hanno Hanno Ruder something earlier. Hanno, are you are you on? Well, I can check with him separately. We won't be able to discuss it, but I also appreciate Barry's uh, point about the cross uh, fertilization and cross interactions. You know, we we separate this into three categories, but there's definitely issues in operation and maintenance that that overlap with uh, performance and and design and chemistry. Every everything interacts. It's just that we sometimes have more of a focus in what people emphasize. Uh, Dr. George Budick has his, uh, his hand raised. I believe you'd like to make a comment. All right, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, I would just like to react to uh, Dr. Bianchini's uh, presentation because I think there are a few open points there, which uh, which are I think are, are important to discuss. So first of all, I would like to confirm that. Uh, with uh, oh sorry, I am from MBMEGI, which is X and XTO XGEA. So uh, we know a thing or two about the V frame. And uh, the first thing I, I would like to confirm that the fan stacks of the V frame, or as an XTO calls it, in air, uh, are always much higher, significantly higher than the A frame ACC. And I think this probably. This has to be taken account uh, taken into account in, uh, in, in in such an evaluation, which has been done. And and when I say significantly, it could be twice as tall, or even more than twice as tall. So it's 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 a big difference, and it 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 would probably result in a different result for this evaluation. The second point uh, to uh, to the presentation. Was I? I don't know how many of you have realized there, but the ITD, which was considered, was 35 Kelvin, 35 degrees centigrade ITD, which is a very high ITD. It's not a typical ITD for ACC projects. So, in the past 30 years, the typical ITD of ACC projects has, has reduced significantly, and nowadays, usually I would say a 20 degrees centigrade or Twenty Kelvin uh, ITD is realistic, and in my opinion, may, maybe this is not. This is just more of a feeling and, than a, than a true opinion. In my in my feeling, this this larger ITD actually favors the airflow through the A frame ACC in terms of being less uh, susceptible to wind uh, or to, to to the wind effect. I think it is a little bit more favorable to the A frame ACC. So again. Second point, it would be very interesting to see the results of the evaluation with a lower ITD, with something more in line with what the ITD with with what the ITDs are of today's project, like 20 Kelvin. That would be nice to see. My third point is about the one street uh, V frame ACC. I saw uh, actually in the summary slide this was actually dealt with. So. 
uh, Dr. Bianchini wrote that it would be very interesting to see the results with multiple roles, etc. Again, in my opinion, uh, the V-frame ACC is not a typical one-street ACC, and this is due to structural reasons. So, due to structural reasons, uh, and Axio never even offered less than two streets for a V-frame ACC. And the more number of streets you have for a V-frame ACC, the less chance there is for recirculation. Uh, so, I think Dr. Bianchini is really going in the right direction, and, and the evaluation was very interesting to see. And the effect of the wind screens, I think that's uh, that's that's incredible. As as we saw two years ago in Mexico, they are applied in ACCs, and and uh, to to a, with with a good result. Um, it would be super interesting to see the evaluation with these three, or or I don't know, re redone with these uh, three comments from my side. And and there, there was one last thing. Uh, Dr. Bianchini said that he never saw uh, a CFD study uh, of the airflow comparing the A-frame with the V-frame. And Axio has prepared several of these studies, but of course these were presented to, to prospective customers and, uh, and not to competitors, obviously. But, uh, but in any case, uh, I think it was an interesting presentation and, and it would be super exciting to see the results of the evaluation with uh, with these comments. That's that's all from my side. And thanks. Okay. Thank you very much Thank for you. these questions. Um, well, first of all, um, obviously I'm referring to open literature. I cannot uh, uh, I cannot um, think that my comments are uh, valid uh, uh, for uh, uh, obviously for commercial research that uh, are sure. obviously private, uh, I would be interested to uh, to look at these uh, these results, of course, uh, and perhaps to to discuss concerning the the three questions. Um, well, the, the the height of the of the V frame is actually higher than the A frame. Uh, Perhaps is is not as high as you you mentioned uh, that uh, in your layout is, uh, is usually done, but this is also related to the fact that we only considered one street. So I think first and third question uh, are actually uh, closely related, and uh, obviously with more um, with more streets, uh, the, the layout would be different as well. Concerning the, the the steam temperature, as I understand your second question was about, uh, yeah. if I'm not wrong, uh, yeah, it's a pretty high uh, temperature difference that we have, but mm, I think that the, the the model that we use will not be largely um, affected by using any other uh, temperature difference. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, we, we are assuming that the, the, heat, the heat transfer on the steam side is substantially as large as we want, and uh, uh, the, 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 the driving, uh, the, the, the bottleneck for the heat transfer remains on the, on the air side. As long as this uh, assumption is valid, um, the results that we obtain are insensitive to the to the temperature difference, except for secondary uh, effect as uh, buoyancy, uh, which, however, don't think it will make very substantial uh, changes, reducing the the temperature difference from forty to uh, 20, for example, it, it's in 35, as you, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we, have, we have quite a significant experience with natural draft towers as well, as you know, and uh, we found that the, the draft of natural draft towers is much more stable with higher ITDs. And this is also true for mechanical draft as well. So generally, the, the upwards thermal 
of of such a large cooling system mm -hmm. is more stable and as such less susceptible less susceptible to wind gusts uh, with higher ITDs. And this is why I'm saying with the velocity, the air velocity being lower with the A-frame ACC, if the the thermal is not as strong, if the temperature difference is not as strong and with a lower velocity of the A-frame, that's why I said my feeling is it mm -hmm. is probably more susceptible to wind gusts. Okay, but uh, but but thanks for your uh, thanks for your answers and anyhow it's an it's a very interesting topic and uh, I don't I don't think it's easy to find any kind of conclusion yet. Uh, more research has to be done, but uh, but but it's it's a super exciting topic. And it thanks is. for the presentation. Yeah, it is. thanks, Doctor Badek, for for your comments. Uh, of course, as Always, we are learning every day, right? And every year, and we see uh, research has been done, and um, it, it opened our eyes on uh, more things uh, to come and making the ACC better as well. Of course, we are all learning from this, and it's educational for us. And uh, uh, welcome to opportunity for more uh, on the way. Um, we uh, have to conclude today um, uh, the, the session, and uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Scott from uh, Combined uh, Cycle Journal and Sheila from SV Events for uh, uh, accommodating us here. And uh, and uh, now I'm going to turn it to Scott. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow to conclude the 2021 ACC Users Group virtual conference with day three, uh, operation and maintenance moderated by Rishi Belkar of NV Energy. Um, we'll also, Andy Howell will have a pretty lengthy presentation um, on the ACC uh, Users Group guidelines. Uh, any updates to those? Um, and if you want to see those reports, they're listed in the chat right now uh, via hyperlink. Um, guidelines for fin tubing, uh, flow accelerated corrosion, uh, and internal inspection. Um, so we'll see you back here tomorrow. Uh, and thanks very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.